Good evening. My name is Megan Kane, and I am a senior rhetoric and public address major from Omaha, Nebraska. Tonight, I have the pleasure of introducing this evening's speaker, Anthony Slide. Anthony Slide is a film historian and author, a former associate archivist of the American Film Institute and resident film historian of the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts and Sciences. He has authored or edited more than 250 books on the history of popular entertainment. In recognition of his work on the history of American popular culture, Mr. Slide received an honorary doctorate of letters from Bowling Green University. His books, The American Film Industry, A Historical Dictionary, and The Encyclopedia of Vaudeville, are awarded, were award, awarded Outstanding Reference Source of the Year by the American Library Association. He is also the editor of It's the Pictures That Got Small, Charles Brackett on Billy Wilder in Hollywood's Golden Age. Please join me in welcoming Anthony Slide. Hello again. Well, I'm ready for my close-up. And, and I can't help thinking when I heard that this um, talk was going to be streamed, I, I wondered how Billy Wilder and Gloria Swanson would have thought, um, you know, well, how many years later, 50, 67 years later, that we would have streaming and we could see movies anytime we wanted to, a totally different age. Anyway, enough of that. Um, I met Billy Wilder once. We had dinner. He and his then collaborator, I.A.L. Diamond, back in, and my, back in 1977. And as one might expect, it was Do Billy who dominated the conversation. I can recall our discussing a newly released Paramount feature film, Black Sunday, directed by John Frankenheimer. Billy noted that it was better than any of the universal films of the same genre. There was a pause, the sort of pregnant pause that only a raconteur such as Billy Wilder could deliver, and he continued. But then any film is better than something produced by Universal. <laughs> well, Billy Wilder worked at Universal only once as a writer, but during the period we now identify as the golden age of Hollywood, he did work at Paramount with Charles Brackett as his writing partner and then as both his writing partner and producer. There was a period in the early 1950s when Billy did not have a permanent collaborator, not that the lack of one um, prevented his making such classics as Ace in the Hole, Starlag 17, Sabrina, and The Seven Year Itch, but he really seemed, consciously or unconsciously, to need someone at his side, and certainly IAL Izzy Diamond served that purpose from 1957 onwards as the two turned out scripts for such films as Some Like It Heart, The Apartment, and a dozen more familiar titles. While Diamond did not function in the capacity of a producer, Billy and he did have a permanent producer in the Mirish Brothers, first Harold Mirish and then Walter Mirish. I'm here to talk of Billy Wilder and Hollywood's golden age, and in so doing, I must also talk of Charles Brackett, it was Hollywood's golden age, and it was a golden age for both men. And as I look at Billy's later post-bracket career, I see links back to that golden age. Walter Mirisch, a fine gentleman, a good friend to me as well, I might add, I edited his autobiography, and very much alive today. He reminds me of Charles Brackett. Walter may be Jewish and Charlie might have been Christian, but the two men were Billy's producer, and both might be considered as senior statesmen in the Hollywood community, with both serving as long-term presidents of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. So I'm just going to try and figure out the best way to see the script with the lighting. Okay. So I do need to see the script. So how did Billy achieve his exalted place in Hollywood history? As one of the few filmmakers whose name is instantly recognizable, not just to members of the film establishment, but also to the general public. Billy Wilder was born in 1906 in a remote corner of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, which is now part of Poland. As Billy would joke, it was half a mile from Vienna by telegraph. 
A few years earlier, Adolf Hitler also had been born in Austria. And just as the world identified Hitler as German, so did Billy Wilder similarly, so is Billy Wilder similarly identified as German in that he began his film career as a screenwriter in Berlin. Billy's approach to a career was not quite as ruthless as that of Adolf Hitler, but both men have left their mark on history, one in a good way and one in a very bad way. It was Hitler and the Nazis who forced Billy to flee Germany in 1933 and eventually to come the following year to America. It was Hitler who killed Billy's mother, stepfather, and grandmother in Auschwitz. Let us not forget that Hitler was Austrian, Billy would often tell interviewers. And also, Billy by the Wilder was not, by the way, above exploiting his early life. Recently, I found a listing at, at Paramount of all the scripts they owned, but which they had never produced. And among them, I found a title called Birth of a Hero, screenplay by Billy Wilder and Charles Brackett. We don't know when it was written, but obviously after 1939. The plot basically is of a football player of Polish descent who goes to Poland to rescue his grandmother before the German invasion. But the Nazi blitzkrieg begins, and the old lady, a fiery patriot, enlists the aid of her grandson and an American girl photographer to carry some of Poland's gold reserves safely out of the country. I assume Billy saw himself as the American hero. It was Hitler's actions that indirectly led to Billy's making Five Graves to Cairo, a 1943 World War II drama set in the sands of Egypt, to a foreign affair released in 1948, a cynical examination of a war-ravaged Berlin and a cabaret singer, Marlene Dietrich, who hides her background as the mistress of a high-ranking Nazi. Billy had been sent to Germany in 1945 to help with the Nazi denazification program. Who else but Billy Wilder could have found Nazi war crimes a subject for humor? Billy returned to Germany at war with Starlight 17 in 1953, the semi-comic story of a group of American airmen thwarting the Nazis in a German prisoner of war camp. Very realistic for its time, surprisingly. And again in 1961, he was back in Germany with 123, the weakest of what might be called the German quartet with capitalism represented by Coca-Cola, standing strong and American against the Cold War and a divided Berlin. Ironically, the Berlin Wall began to be built while Billy was actually filming there on 123. Despite what was happening in Europe, Billy was not above joking about the war. In April 1941, when things looked bleak for Britain, he considered what might happen to, in Hollywood, to Hollywood Jews when the Nazis invaded. He surmised MGM head Louis B. Mayer would be smuggled in, into Mexico in the rumble seat of producer Arthur Freed's car. Sam Goldwyn would be caught and slaughtered in Bakersfield. Billy didn't like Sam Goldwyn very much. <laughs> uh, while Billy himself would find refuge on a ranch to which Charlie Brackett would send him 65 cents worth of food a week. More seriously, both Billy and Ernst Lubitsch believed that if Britain lost the war, within six months, they and other Jews would no longer be allowed to work in the industry. The feeling was stoked by a general opinion that most Americans were anti-Semitic and that communists in Hollywood were pro-Nazi thanks to the German-Russian non-aggression pact. Charlie Brackett, in fact, recorded actor John Garfield, whom he described as a real stinker, talking at lunch of his hatred for England and his love of Russia. Initially, life was not easy for Billy Wilder in Hollywood. He had entered America on a tourist visa and was forced to cross the border into Mexico and reapply for a permanent visa. He used his experience in part in the writing of Hold Back the Dawn in 1941. He had made at least two decent films in Europe, People on Sunday, a cinematic, cinema verite look at the life of ordinary Berliners in 1929, and Bad Seed, shot in France in 1934 and starring Daniel Darrieux. But his reputation did not follow him to America. Billy Wilder's life changed on August the 17th, 1936, 
when Paramount decided that he was to be, to be teamed as a screenwriter with Charles Brackett. It was, in fact, a life-changing event for both men. Charlie Brackett had a reputation as a novelist, a short story writer, and theater critic for The New Yorker. He was a member of the Algonquin Round Table. But he had made little, if any, impact as a screenwriter in Hollywood. The two men were as different as it is perhaps possible to be. Brackett was an Episcopalian, the skian of a wealthy New England family, a product of the Harvard Law School, a Republican whose ancestors had come to America in the 1600s. He was erudite, intelligent, and what might be described in crude terms as a wasp, a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. Billy Wilder was Jewish, a former journalist, a Democrat, and someone whose grasp of English was not always perfect. He once complained that English is a tough language because there are no, too many letters in the words. They are the wor letters that are totally useless. There was a kind of improbability about Wilder. He was already world weary. He was a hypochondriac. When somebody else had a heart attack, he would rush immediately to the office of his cardiologist. <laughs> and to a large extent, he was lazy. He did not take kindly to criticism from studio executives. He was, in the word, words of Charles Brackett, I quote, a neurotic genius who craved persecution, unquote. Billy was a notorious womanizer. Charlie was married, perhaps not happily, and remained faithful to a wife who suffered from mental problems and alcoholism. When it came to relationships, Billy could be very cavalier in his attitude. When Brackett got excited over the presence of Marlena Dietrich in the restaurant, at a restaurant in which the couple were eating, Wilder snorted, quote, Marlena, if the waiter were to wheel over a big covered dish with her in it stark naked, I'd say not interested, and have him wheel her away. The story of, is told of Billy's receiving a letter from, from a lady friend with whom he'd had a brief affair. He tore it up, not even bothering to read it. And then he retrieved a piece of the gray colored paper, noting it was exactly the color, he, the perfect shade for his bathroom wall. <laughs> Paramount was one of the major Hollywood studios of the era, boasting such stars at one time or another as Pola Negri, Gloria Swanson, who you just saw, Clara Bow, Mae West, Claudette Colbert, Marlene Dietrich, W.C. Fields, and Maurice Chevalier. It had some of the best directors under contract, Cecil B. DeMille, who again you just saw, Joseph von Sternberg, Ernst Lubitsch, who also served as Paramount's head of production, Mitchell Lyson, Uber Mamoulian, and Preston Sturgis. Metro Goldwyn Mayer might claim that it had more stars in Hollywood, in heaven, I'm sorry, but Paramount, at least in my opinion, could have boasted that it had more creative and original stars under contract. Not only stars, but original and creative directors and original and creative writers, in particular the team of Wilder and Brackett. Paramount operated very much as a family, and I think you get that notion actually watching um, Sunset Boulevard when Norma Desmond comes to the studio. There is really a very nice atmosphere there. They're all welcoming back someone from the past. They still remember her. They still adore her. She means a great deal to them. Paramount was a comfortable studio in which to work. It nurtured creativity. Writers such as Brackett and Wilder did not work set, set hours, didn't clock in. They arrived at the studio whenever it was convenient to them. They would seldom work before lunch, preferring perhaps to discuss the films they might have seen the previous evening together or separately. Lunch would be taken together or separately in the studio commissary or at Lucy's restaurant across the road from the studio on Melrose Avenue. After lunch, Charlie Brackett would generally take a nap on the day bed kindly provided by the studio in the couple's multi-room office. Around 4 p.m., work might begin. Often it would continue into the evening, after dinner, at the home of one or the other writers. Working at the studio, Charlie would lie on the daybed, a yellow pad on his lap, while Billy paced the floor, usually with a riding crop in his hand, throwing out ideas or dialogue. The latter, which Charlie would translate into understandable English, 
um, he would then put right eye on his yellow pad. Decipherable to just about to nobody. And these were handed over to, I'm sorry, I'm getting confused here, were handed over to the couple's indefatigable secretary, Helen Hernandez, who would transcribe them. In a way, I always see Helen Hernandez as the forgotten heroine in the Billy Wilder, Charles Brackett story. Charlie quickly realized that his temperamental partner always had to originate an idea. The thing to do, explained Brackett, was to suggest an idea, have it torn apart and despised. A few days later, it would be apt to turn up, slightly changed as Wilder's idea. Once I got adjusted to this way of working, our lives were much simpler. When we speak of Hollywood's golden age, we do not reference independent or low-budget films of the era, but rather the films of the major studios, films that were guaranteed an audience simply because the studios owned the theaters in which they played. And Americans routinely, as a matter of course, went to the movies on a weekly basis. It didn't matter what was playing, the family went to the movies every Monday night or every Saturday night or whenever. There were no flops in the golden age. Every film found an audience, a captive one. Let us look at Paramount Pictures as representative of that golden age. And let us look at Billy Wilder and Charles Brackett, because we cannot really discuss Wilder without Brackett, as exemplary of the creativity of that golden age. If it's a paramount picture, it's the best show in town, claimed the studio's advertising slogan, and indeed it was. And in a way, it all began in 1929, when a paramount film, Wings, won the first Academy Award for Best Picture. A few years later, the studio had two of the greatest writers in Hollywood under contract, Brackett and Wilder, hailed by Life magazine as the happiest couple in Hollywood. In reality, they were anything but. Like many a Hollywood marriage, it was a sham, an arranged marriage. Today, screenwriters select their partners, but back then there was no self-selection. It was the studio who determined who your writing partner was to be. Thankfully for us, the viewing public, Wilder and Brackett, stayed together and flourished. If not forever, at least for long enough to provide us with some memorable films. Once Billy had started directing and Charlie had started producing the scripts that they wrote together, they became collective studio auteurs. I know Billy doesn't like the term auteur, but that's what they were. Very much responsible for all aspects of the film, the casting, the look, the construction, whatever. But this came later. First, it was a writing partnership, nothing more or nothing less, which we've no plans for it to last for a decade or more. The first of the Wilder Brackett collaborations was Bluebeard's Last Wife, on which the couple worked from 1936 through 1937, with the film going into release in 1938. The leading players were Paramount stars Claudette Colbert and Gary Cooper. But more importantly, the director of this sophisticated comedy about a seven times married and divorced millionaire was legendary German-born director Ernst Lubitsch. It was always maintained that his films did not take place in America or Europe, but rather in Lubitsch land, a timeless country of grace, charm, wisdom, and sophistication. Lubitsch was a leading light of Hollywood's golden age, and importantly, he was a man of whom both Wilder and Brackett stood in awe. When he died in 1947, Billy Wilder was a pallbearer at his funeral, and Brackett read the eulogy. When someone commented, no more Lubitsch, Wilder responded, worse, no more Lubitsch films. Thereafter, Billy Wilder had a gold-framed sign on his wall across from his desk. It read simply, how would Lubitsch have done it? It was Lubitsch who taught Billy Wilder how to direct. And he would often repeat a tip that Lubitsch had given to him. Never underestimate the intelligence of the audience. I suppose in a way, one might argue that Hollywood's golden age ended with the death of Ernst Lubitsch. No more Lubitsch films. Only dull reality and an obsession with realism that was to be reignited in the 1950s. 
But that was still a decade away for Billy Wilder, as he and Brackett were loaned by Paramount to Universal to ride a vehicle for Deanna Durbin. Now, in theory, this might, not, might sound like torture for the two men working on a film for a child star who was fast eclipsing Shirley Temple as America's favorite young person. But it wasn't, in large part because both men actually liked Deanna Durbin, who was intelligent beyond her years and had a healthy contempt for her career. Years later, in fact, she described herself to me as, I quote, synthetic old Durbin of the 30s, and that's how she viewed her films and her career. What disturbed the two men most was that Universal was not paramount. It was far from glamorous. In fact, Charlie Brackett described it as a friendly, shabby little studio. One actress actually told me that her remembrance of Universal was that it didn't provide toilet paper. So much for Hollywood's golden age. Roderick Crawford, whom some of you may remember from television's Highway Patrol and the great 1949 biopic about Huey Long, All the King's Men, once told me that being under contract to Universal was, quote, like being stuck in a sewer without rotor rooter. <laughs> in a way, the Universal sojourn was an irrelevancy in that Wilder and Brackett took their names off the film, owing to a dispute as to the credit line. The most annoying aspect of the whole episode to Billy was that the film, That Certain Age, which was really his and Brackett's film, got good reviews. Back at Paramount, the couple worked on a Lubitsch-like production, Midnight with Claudette Colbert, masquerading as a Hungarian countess in Parisian society. It was directed by Mitchell Lyson, who had some of Lubitsch's qualities, but was also prissy, argumentative, and inclined to interfere with the script. Midnight was followed by a real Lubitsch film, and one of his most famous, Ninochka, a satire on the Cold War and Russian politics set in Paris. The worst part of Ninochka for both Wilder and Brackett was that it was shot at MGM, with the couple again on loan out from Paramount through July 1939. They didn't like the formality of MGM. They didn't like having to clock in and Billy retaliated by deciding he had a tumor of the brain and feigning a nervous breakdown. He was genuinely unhappy, perhaps an understatement, when news of the German-Russian pact was announced and when, on September 1st, 1939, he heard on the radio of Germany's bombardment of Poland with his grandmother on the front line of the attack. On September 3rd, 1939, the entire company was devastated to learn of the sinking by Nazi U-boats of the British line of the Athenia, on, which, on board of which was Lubitsch's 11-month-old daughter. Happily, she survived. But the Europe of which Wilder and Brackett was joking was under attack, and certainly the war had made a major impact on Billy Wilder. On November 10, 1940, Billy took care of his naturalization papers. He chose Charles Brackett to accompany him I think this is very important to stress because we read so much about Wilder and Brackett's being antagonistic towards each other, but when it came to becoming an American citizen, it was Charlie Brackett whom Billy Wilder selected to be at his side. He didn't choose any of his German emigre friends. He didn't choose Lubitsch. He chose Charlie Brackett. Of course, Brackett had his own opinion of middle European immigrants such as Billy Wilder. I quote, it seems to me that they've come into a department store, been crazy about its stock, and put themselves down for a charge account. No more involvement than that, unquote. Ninatra, of course, is remembered as much for its star, Greta Garbo, as its director or its script. It was the actress's penultimate film, and certainly one of her best. Had Billy Wilder and Charlie Brackett had their way, Garbo's career would not have ended. They tried unsuccessfully to cast her for the Anne Baxter role in Five Graves to Cairo. Bob Hope was under contract to Paramount, and in 1943, it was suggested that he and Garbo team for a comedy. The studios liked the idea. Garbo did not, nor do I. She may not have been too enthusiastic about Bob Hope, but she admitted to being crazy about Bing Crosby. 
And in 1945, when Wilder and Brackett initially began work on The Emperor Waltz, Billy's first film in color, he much preferred to work in black and white, Garbo actively considered coming out of retirement to play opposite Bing Crosby. She told Wilder and Brackett how much she liked them, how much she liked the story, how much she loved the star, but she had a pathological fear of returning to the screen. She never did. Too bad. Meanwhile, Brackett and Wilder had been again loaned out by Paramount. Now, loan outs of contract artists brought in a healthy income to studios, with the employee receiving their regular salary and the studio returning substantially more from the lendee. Samuel Golden was a happy, happy recipient of the pair, and the film they wrote for him was Ball of Fire, a comedy about a burlesque dancer, a great role for Barbara Stanwyck, who moves in with eight fissy college professors. Maybe we could remake it at Hillsdale who wanted to help with an encyclopedia they are completing on the subject of slang. What is fascinating is that Brackett, who was too well educated for his own good, and Wilder, who had problems with the English language, actually created Argot, the sort of slang with which the burlesque dancer might be familiar. Without Paramount's knowledge, Wilder and Brackett later in 1947 were to gain for Goldwyn writing scenes for The Bishop's Wife, which starred Cary Grant, hopelessly miscast in the opinion of the two men. While today we remember Wilder, Brackett is relatively forgotten, but it's worth noting that at Paramount, Brackett's salary was several times greater than that of Wilder. Obviously, it was a source of almost constant irritation to Wilder, and then Paramount came up with a solution. Wilder should also direct the films he and Brackett were writing, and he could be paid more money. That, of course, led to Billy's complaining that he was directing for nothing, and also led to Brackett's complaining that he should be paid more still. So he was elevated to the role of producer, and again, his salary was ahead of that of his colleague. Is that a true story? Is that how Billy Wilder became a director? In all probability, at least according to Charles Brackett, it is. But the official Billy Wilder version is that he was unhappy with changes that director Mitchell Lyson had made to the script of Hold Back the Dawn. And he decided the solution was for him to direct the next film the couple wrote in 1942, The Major and the Minor, a film which wanted its audience to believe that Ginger Rogers could pass as a 12-year-old girl. It was actually well received and is still entertaining today. And of course, sexual deception and sexual repression are major themes in Billy Wilder's films. It's the major and the minor is perhaps not the most propitious start to a directorial career that has become legendary, but then not exactly a bad start, simply not a very memorable one. And there's the same problem with Billy's next film, Five Graves to Cairo. Then, it's almost as if Billy Wilder hits his stride as a director, and the next two films will heavily impact his career and his standing with critics and later historians. Most of what had come before was comedy, but here, handling two serious subjects, Billy shows his versatility both as a director and a screenwriter. The Double Indemnity, released in April 1944, Billy had a new and most unsatisfactory collaborator in novelist Raymond Chandler. There has been much speculation as to why Brackett and Wilder temporarily split, but it is in all probability not as traumatic as some might have one believe. The two men actually wrote the first treatment of Double Indemnity together, and Charlie actually helped with some of the dialogue for the film, um, there were days actually when Billy was on the set, he, was, he knew he had problems with the script for the next day, he couldn't contact Raymond Chandler, so he asked Charlie to help out, and Charlie did. But Charlie recorded that Billy was, quote, having a touch of claustrophobia working with him, and it was time for a break, of which he approved. And he probably took a certain delight in the ecstasy of torture, as he called it, that was working with Raymond Chandler. Regardless, as you will learn from tomorrow's speaker, Alan Silver, and tomorrow's screening, Double Indemnity, is the work of a great director 
and a production that defines film noir. The Lost Weekend, released more than a year later, is arguably one of the most important of the Wilder Brackett films at Paramount. It is based on a best-selling novel by Charles Jackson, who consistently tried to interfere with the production, and, was, and who was despised by both Wilder and Brackett. The book was published in 1944, the same year as the film began production. The Lost Weekend won the Academy Award for Best Picture, an award which Brackett points out that he should have received rather than Paramount Executive Henry Ginsburg, Best Actor, Best Screenplay, a first for Brackett and Wilder, and other Oscars, perhaps most notably Best Film Editing for Brackett and Wilder's longtime and long-suffering collaborator Duane Harrison. It was not the initial choice of either Brackett or Wilder. At that time, and neither men appeared to have taken the Lost Weekend's theme of alcoholism very seriously. When they were told of opposition to the film from both Alcoholics Anonymous and the allied liquor industries, Brackett and Wilder assured the former that they would not argue that a psychiatrist was necessary to an alcoholic's cure, as AA feared. The liquor industry was informed that if Brackett and Wilder were to receive a case of scotch each week in perpetuity, they would manage, quote, to make the spectators lick their lips, unquote. <laughs> Brackett and Wilder celebrated the end of shooting on December 23rd, 1944, by distributing liquor to the crew on the set. The day after the Academy Awards, Brackett and Wilder arrived at Paramount to find the writer's building garlanded with rows of whiskey bottles. At a final studio celebration on March 11th, 1946, in the commissary, Brackett was presented with a present of a whiskey bottle, surrounded by sleeping tablets, a tube of morphine, and a hypodermic needle. <laughs> and finally, this is my favorite story, um, it, it, it must be reported that in May 1945, The Lost Weekend had a preview in San Bernardino, California. It was marred by the projectionist being drunk and screening the reels out of order, um, something which apparently the audience didn't notice. <laughs> Wilder and Brackett may not have cared too much about the film, but we see here their ongoing power at the studio. They approved the replacement of leading man Cary Grant with Ray Milland. Jane Wyman was always their choice for female lead, but Paramount initially balked at paying the $40,000 fee asked by Warner Brothers had had her under contract. Dorothy Lamour is free, the studio suggested. Billy and Charlie discussed the matter a little frightened, but they got Wyman as they wanted. And the only major problem was that Jane Wyman's nipples were clearly visible through her sweater in one scene. And speaking of sexual matters, much to Brackett's annoyance, Wilder cast his mistress, Doris Dowling, in a relatively prominent role. Brackett denounced her performance as amateurish and accused Wilder of being too afraid to tell her so. By the way, if you're going to be partaking of a glass of wine or something stronger after my talk, I would like you to raise a glass, not only to Billy Wilder, but couple it with a toast to the lost weekend. <laughs> By the late 1940s, the film industry was changing. As far as I am concerned, the golden age was about over. The government consent decree which had taken many years and endless lawsuits to become reality, meant the studios had to divest themselves of their theaters. They no longer had a guaranteed home for their films, nor a guaranteed audience. The studio system itself was failing, and the end was in sight when studios could no longer keep stars and creative personnel under long-term contract. Television would soon become the viewing public's medium of choice. No more weekly visits to the movies, Paramount Pictures were no longer the best show of ta in town. The late 1940s also saw the birth of the McCarthy era, with the anti-communist witch hunts affecting Hollywood, which had never really been immune from politics, generally left wing. When 10 screenwriters refused to testify before the House Committee on Un-American Activities, they were arrested in 1950 and branded the Hollywood 10 or the unfriendly 10. Billy Wilder quipped, one or two of them were talented, the rest were just unfriendly. Billy himself tried to keep above politics, 
perhaps aware of his immigrant status. He was a liberal, and his attitude towards communism is apparent from Ninochka. The film caricatured the Cold War, just as later the Emperor Waltz was, parody, was a parody of the Austro-Hungarian Empire into which he had been born. Perhaps the, the only really real political stance he took was when he, he opposed the enforcement of a loyalty oath for members of the Screen Directors Guild. In fact, about the only evidence of Billy's having any strong politics, political beliefs, or racist views is contained in an argument with his wife, Judith. He told her to fire the couple's African-American servants because they were lazy, and to make sure their replacements were white. Because all Negroes are lazy, Judith angrily responded, you can't say that any more than you can say all Jews are shysters and cheats. In reply, Wilder said, the only generalization one can make is that all capitalists are sons of bitches. Happy day in the Wilder household. The partnership of Billy Wilder and Charlie Brackett was coming to its conclusion. What had been a marriage was no longer even a friendship. The arguments and ill feelings increased. There was even violence when Billy brought a flute into the office and, insist and insisted on constantly playing it, only to have Charlie grab the instrument from his hands, put it across his knee, and snap it in two. There was no more work that day. Billy's marriage to his first wife, Judith, came to an end, and in 1948, he married his second wife, Audrey. Charlie didn't approve of Billy's mistresses. He liked Judith and he did not like Audrey, one of those many mistresses. And also bringing the golden age to a close was the greatest film that Wilder and Brackett made, and the film generally considered to be Billy's best as a director, of course, Sunset Boulevard. Here is a film that positively declares war on its audience as it depicts a Hollywood that Hollywood did not want to reveal. It might be melodramatic at times, but Sunset Boulevard is a film unlike any of the earlier happy depictions of life in the film industry and in, the, and in Hollywood. It's a film that combines the cynicism, wit, and sheer nastiness of Billy Wilder with the romanticism and glorification of the past so close to the heart of Charlie Brackett. The golden age was over. Both Brackett and Wilder continued to prosper, with Charlie's becoming a senior producer at 20th Century Fox and Billy making one successful film after another. Through the years, in a way, Billy Wilder acknowledged his debt to writer Brackett by insisting that films were, quote, authored, unquote, and that the direction should take place in the writing. It was the words that mattered. And it is the words of Norma Desmond in Sunset Boulevard, written by Wilder, that resonate through the years in his career. I quote, we'll make another picture, and another, and another. You see, this is my life. It always will be. Thank you. Thank you. You. Mr. Slide has agreed to sign copies of the book. It's the pictures that got small. Charles Brackett on Billy Wilder and Hollywood Golden Age, directly following the lecture in Phillips Lobby. We now have time for a few questions. Please raise your hand and wait for a microphone to be brought to you. I know now we have uh, people that are classified as great producers great directors, and great writers. Yet fewer and fewer do we see combination writer-directors or writer-producers. Would you classify, Billy Wilder was basically started out as a writer and then became a writer-director. Did he do films that were written by others? Um, no, he didn't, I don't think. Uh, well, certainly not while he was in Hollywood anyway. Um, but I think also it's, it's, you can't, it's not a matter of just classifying, say, Billy uh, as one thing. I think you have to group him and, and Racket together and creatively 
they are great producers, writers, and directors. And just as uh, later you have, say, Walter Mirisch, I.A.L. Diamond, and Billy Wilder, and they are great writers, directors, and producers. Um, so they would work as a pack. Yes, I think so, yes. I mean, I think Brackett and Wilder needed each other. They obviously, I mean, initially I, I've, I edited Charlie Brackett's diaries, and uh, when it, the diary entry for his first meeting with Billy Wilder doesn't contain very much of interest, but he appended a note that he wrote a dozen years later in which he talks about how important he realized that moment was in his career. So, so yes, I think it was important to Brackett. I don't think, I don't think Wilder really thought that much about it. He was just happy to have a contract with Paramount, and so who he was working with initially didn't really matter. Um, but, because you know, we don't know what goes on through the men's minds, but since at some point they must have realized they needed each other. Uh, and, and, you know, as I'm sure you're going to, it is Alan Silver who's talking, isn't it? you Alan Silver. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm thought I'm talking to somebody else. Okay, I'll stop talking to you then. Oh, no, okay, so I'm sorry. No, but I'm, I was going to say that Billy Wilder finds out, um, as Alan Silver will tell us tomorrow, um, that working with Raymond Chandler, having a new collaborator was not um, that great an experience, and maybe he was better off with Charlie Brackett. Thanks. Could you talk a bit about how the industry reacted to Sunset Boulevard, given what a devastating satire about uh, the yes. industry it is? I don't think the industry was at all happy. Louis B. Mayer was outraged. Um, it's strange in a way because one would assume somebody like Hedda Hopper also would, being a representative of the industry with her gossip column, you'd have thought she would be outraged as well. But then, of course, she agreed to appear in the film, in large part because... She, um, she was such a close friend of Charlie Brackett's, and, and yet again, here we have that strange anomaly in Hollywood. We have Charlie Brackett, who is, a, no, I'm sorry, it's not an anomaly at all. It's actually because Charlie Brackett is a conservative, and Hedda Hopper is a conservative. There aren't that many conservatives in Hollywood, so when the two of them get together, they really get together. So I think that's why Hedda Hopper agreed to be in the film. I haven't really answered your question. But, um, but the, no, the film industry was not happy at all um, with the film. Sunset Boulevard. Um, I think I also, things I couldn't say earlier, for example, you have to remember that Gloria Swanson wasn't that old when she made the film. She's not as old as Norma Desmond is supposed to be. And in fact, um, when they asked her to, to appear as a 50-year-old woman, she said, but Irene Dunn is older than I am. Why don't you cast Irene Dunn in the part? So, but I think, she, I think again, again, I'm sorry, I'm not answering your question, but I'm Pointing, I'm being a politician here. I'm twisting the questions around to what I want to say. Um, so, um, so in, but in a way, I think you have to admire Gloria Swanson for taking on this role and, you know, and giving such a magnificent performance. Why do you think the film didn't win more awards? I'm sorry, why did, well, I think it, it, it's, it, uh, Gloria Swanson was, of course, nominated for, for Best Actress for her role, but the, the, it eventually went to Anne Baxter for um, All About Eve. No? Judy Holloway. I'm sorry, Judy. It went to Judy Holloway? It did go to Judy Holloway? Oh, okay, I'm sorry. I'm stunned corrected. Anyway, the point is, Gloria Swanson um, didn't win Best Actress, and she really should have done. Uh, um, but, and in fact, the only award that Sunset Boulevard won was for Best um, Original Screenplay, which went to Brackett Wilder and Don Marshman. So, uh, I, I, so in a way, it, is, it was popular with members of the film establishment who are not maybe the heads of studios or major producers, but the ordinary men and women who vote for the Academy Awards. Um, but ultimately, it didn't make that much of an impact at the Academy Awards show, winning only one award. I'm sorry, I haven't really answered your question. Please stand. You make the remark on the Hollywood 10. I was, yes. You made the remark on the Hollywood 10, which seemed to suggest that we were unfair to the Hollywood 10. No. And I would think that the Hollywood 10 liked Stalin's Russia. And I don't think that, I think 
to morally condemn that is justified. Well, first of all, I don't think I was that sort of um, positive about the Hollywood 10. I was actually making a joke about them. Um, but I don't think the Hollywood 10, first of all, had much of an impact on Hollywood politics at all. Um, they were ex on the whole extreme um, left-wingers, people like John Howard Lawson, for example, who was a known communist. Uh, I mean, you know, when I say a known communist, it was somebody who, who, who admitted to being a communist um, quite openly. Um, but you're getting into a whole other area. You're asking me to say, was it, was it, was America justified in persecuting screenwriters for their political views? And I don't think the answer is yes. Um, but at the same time, I think an awful lot of fuss was being made about these 10 men who weren't very important. Okay, all right, good. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Slide. Okay, thank you.